lovers and welcome to 21 Conversations, the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I'm Dabney Sanders, board chair of the Greensboro Literary Organization. Greensboro Bound is so excited to present to you these 21 Conversations, our effort to create something unique and special for our community within the confines of our continued virtual environment. 21 Conversations pays homage to North Carolina's rich literary history while broadening our tent to welcome in voices from outside of our own microcosm of experience. This featured presentation is but a taste of the 52 authors that we have gathered together in a series of delightful, sometimes unexpected, but always edifying conversations. Since our inception, Greensboro Bound has been committed to providing programs just like the one you were about to watch, 100% free to our community. And in order to do that, we need the financial support, both big and small, of readers just like you. Please support Greensboro Bound by giving now. The text to give phone number as well as our website are on your screen. A sustaining gift of just $15 a month or the cost of a single children's book will help us remain financially solvent throughout the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sustaining supporters without whom Greensboro Bound would not be possible. Our utmost gratitude to the Edward M. Armfield Senior Foundation, the Ruth Lands Memorial Fund, and Arts Greensboro for their continued belief in our vision to bring together readers and writers of all genres, ages, ethnicities, identities, and voices to foster an understanding of writing as a process that allows free expression, deepens critical thought, and helps sustain a culture of inquiry and delight that is open to all. Thank you again for joining us for the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Please enjoy the conversation. Hi, everyone. This is Brian Lampkin with Greensboro Bound, and welcome to our conversation on Wilmington in 1898, um, thought of as the Wilmington coup, the Wilmington white riots. Um, yeah, it's an important event here in North Carolina for sure. And we have two people we couldn't be happier to be, have to talk about this event. We have David Zucchino with us today. David Zucchino is the author of Wilmington's Lie, published in 2020, The Murderous Coup of 1898 and the Rise of White Supremacy. David is a contributing writer for the New York Times. He's been awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting from South Africa. He's a four-time Pulitzer Prize finalist and the author of other books, including Thunder Run, The Armored Strike to Capture Baghdad, and The Myth of the Welfare Queen. Um, so that's David. And then John Sales is with us today. John is the author of uh, several novels, including this one, A Moment in the Sun, which was published in, I believe, 2010. And the reason we're going to talk about this book, as opposed to John's newest novel, Yellow Earth, is that A Moment in the Sun takes place in 1898 America. And about a quarter of it focuses on the Wilmington riot as well, um, along with many other things happening in America and the world in 1898. So I couldn't imagine better conversation partners than John Sales and David Zucchino today. Uh, John, of course, um, filmmaker, legendary filmmaker, 17, 17 films, John, is that right? Or 18. 18 films, um, including Amigo, which is partially based on this, this book, but a different part of the book. Um, and of course, we're wondering if there's going to be a film of the Wilmington 1898 riots in your future, but well, yeah. maybe. Oh, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid it's too expensive. <laughs> okay. Uh, John, anyway, many other great films. Return of this Caucus 7 is the, uh, the first one. Um, Lone Star was Academy Award, Screenwriter Academy Award nomination, as was Passion Fish, I believe. And just so many great films. I'm a huge fan. Um, and I always tell people, Union Dues, John's early novel, I read on a train ride across Canada in the 1980s. I think it made me a reader for life. I mean, that was just a one lovely experience. So thank you for that, John Sales. 
All right, uh, let's begin our conversation in earnest. Um, David, uh, boy, what led you to Wilmington 1898 and what happened at Wilmington in 1898 and why Wilmington? Yeah, well, first of all, what led me to it was my ignorance. I didn't know anything about it. I went to high school and college in North Carolina and never heard one word about it. And I took a lot of history classes. It was never mentioned. I did not hear about it until uh, 1998 when there were centennial efforts in Wilmington and I started reading news coverage. Um, and it was the first I ever heard about it. And, and I was stunned that I could be so ignorant of such an important event uh, in not only North Carolina history, but, but American history. Uh, and secondly, that something like this could happen in the United States. So um, I decided at that time, um, I was going to write about it. It just took me a while. I have a real job, a day job, and it just took me a while uh, to get around to writing it. But uh, essentially, I wanted to um, correct the historical record because it had been uh, mischaracterized and covered up by the perpetrators and, and their descendants uh, for, you know, 100 years. Um, and I wanted to uh, dig in and, and tell the true story and describe what really happened and also talk about uh, the long-term lasting effects, which, uh, as you know, uh, continue to this day. Um, as far as what happened in, um, in Wilmington, 1898, uh, Wilmington was really an outlier among, among Southern cities at the time. First of all, it had a, a majority black population. It was 56% black and most major cities in the South at that time were majority white. More importantly, it had a, a biracial government, which was very unusual. There were uh, black men in positions of authority, both uh, elected office and appointed office. Three of the uh, 10 city aldermen uh, were black men, 10 of the 26 policemen were black men, which was unusual. Um, the, uh, the county treasurer was a black man, the county coroner, uh, the jailer, very unusual situ situation uh, compared to other cities. Um, there was also a thriving black middle class because of all the jobs in Wilmington, which was the biggest city in North Carolina at the time and the most important city. It had the huge port and it was also a railroad terminus and it was also the world leader in uh, the naval stores industry and, you know, pitch tar and turpentine. So there were a lot of jobs and uh, freed, freedmen moved there after the uh, Civil War and built middle class lives. And at the same time, there was a really big for a city that size, a big uh, professional class of, of black lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, and so on. So all of this was a, a, a just um, a huge threat to white supremacy. White supremacists had ruled Wilmington uh, from reconstruction on up until they lost control of the, the state legislature and Wilmington uh, in the early to mid uh, 1890s. And the white supremacists decided uh, they were going to do something about it. They announced it beforehand. Uh, they said they were going to, first of all, win that fall's midterm election by the, the ballot or the bullet or both. And they laid very public plans to overthrow um, the city government, which was not up for reelection that November. It was only um, county, state, and federal offices. So that's the background to what happened. Yeah. And so, John, you're writing a novel that roughly is taking on America at the turn of the century. How did you stumble upon the Wilmington story and, and why did you include it? You know, I had, I had read an article about, um, there was a, a kind of big city meeting in Wilmington and uh, there'd been trouble in the black community between the white and black communities. This is, this is in the eighties, I believe. And, um, Somebody just said, I, I, what's your problem? You black people are doing very, very well. You know, I don't get what this is all about. And, and an African-American woman stood up and she said, it's about bodies floating, you know, in the Cape Fear River. And nobody knew what she was talking about on the white side. On the black side, many people did, you know, especially people who have been longtime residences. And I got interested in the way that history usually isn't forgotten, it's buried. Um, and so at the same time as the, the, the racial coup in, in Wilmington, uh, there was America's first foray into imperialism, which was the Philippine-American War. And in the Philippines, Filipinos don't know about that war. 
And it's because we took over their educational system. And we, it wasn't that we didn't teach this, we buried the history. Um, it was not anything that the United States was especially proud of. It was where we learned to waterboard. Uh, there were congressional committees like there were after Vietnam. Uh, there was torture, there were assassinations. It was a holy mess. Um, and we decided, well, we'll, you know, we'll keep it as a territory, but we're erasing that particular history. And so I got interested in these, these two things that ha were happening at the same time and that they were connected by race, both racism, but also um, at the time of the Spanish American and Philippine American wars, an awful lot of our troops were African American troops with white officers. And a lot of them went to fight both, you know, in the Spanish American war and then went on to, to fight in the Philippines. Um, and were, you know, kind of freaked out that all of a sudden all their fellow white soldiers were calling Filipinos niggers. And, and there was no torture in the Civil War. There was torture in, in you know, the Philippine American War. Why was that? Race is the only really answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have children who are raised in the schools of Eastern North Carolina. And a truism is if you went to school in Eastern North Carolina, you took a field trip to the Charles Acock house and never heard about the Wilmington coup. Mm -hmm. um, and David, I've heard you talk before about the, the important political legs of this coup that you couldn't be elected in North Carolina if you weren't connected to this white riot, which is you know shocking and gives me great pause about our future. But mm -hmm. can you talk about that? Um, like what it, what it meant to 20th century North Carolina politics this 1898 event. Really, I mean, uh, so many important politicians, white politicians in North Carolina, basically established their reputations uh, during the white supremacy campaign of 1898 and the one that followed in 1900. Um, five future governors were speakers on the white supremacy uh, tour uh, who went out on the stump and incited white men to attack black men to prevent them to vote. Uh, Acock was one of them. Um, he built his reputation as, as a very, very effective speaker and as a leader and a participant in the red shirts who were the, the, the vigilante arm of the, of the Democratic Party. Um, other governors, uh, future governors uh, followed. So as you said, it was very difficult in the, in the decades after that for uh, a, a politician to get elected if he did not have that on, on his resume. And it also brought uh, Josephus Daniels to great fame, uh, the editor and publisher of, of the News and Observer, who was the leader of the white supremacist newspaper's propaganda campaign during the summer and, and fall of, of 1898. Um, so this was really a seminal event in, in North Carolina history. I mean, just for example, at uh, UNC, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, there are 30 buildings named for white supremacists, and many of them were involved in the 1898 uh, white supremacy campaign. So um, not only did these men get to write the history, they were honored for it. Up until this day, some of those names are still on those yeah. buildings. 122 years later, we're still honoring um, these men. Yeah, yeah and it, it wasn't just that um, they were more popular because they had been involved in the coup, it was that they almost immediately were able to change the laws so that North Carolina was the last of the former Confederate states to um, basically take the vote away from black people, uh, black men in this case, because women couldn't vote yet. Um, but I, I believe it was a grandfather clause in yes. North Carolina. All the other states had already done this. And, and the ability to do that basically came, I think it was 1875, when it was the Hayes and Tilden election, and it was close enough that it was gonna to go to the electoral college and a backroom deal was made, which is, okay, we'll get, let you Yankees have your um, candidate as long as federal troops march out of the South and you give our states back to us. And from that date on, one by one, I think South Carolina was probably the first because of, uh, Pitchfork Tilden or whatever his name was, ben uh, Tillman. Tillman. Yeah. Um, every state put in some kind of law, whether it was a, a poll tax or 
you had to read the you know Mississippi Constitution and parrot it back or a grandfather clause or something like that. Um, so you know, all of a sudden you had only black, only white men voting, and your chances of you know uh, getting elected if you've been involved in planning that coup uh, were greatly enhanced. Right. Yeah. And the grandfather clause was was extremely significant. And the very people who carried out the coup were elected to the state legislature and in 1900 passed that law, uh, which essentially kept uh, black citizens from voting for the next 60 or 70 years, even though it was overthrown by the Supreme Court in 1914 or or 15. It was already embedded into practice. And as you mentioned, then there were literacy tests and uh, poll taxes uh, that kept black men from voting, but white men were exempt because of the grandfather clause. They weren't affected by it. So it was an incredible, incredibly successful piece of, of legislation. Yeah. Um, David gets into it in, in, in his book, um, which is that just post-Civil War, um, when black men were all of a sudden allowed to vote, um, the response was incredible. And so the, um, the ability of all those people to hold those kind of jobs, to be policemen, to be on the fire department in Wilmington, you know, a, a lot of black men were in the, the fire department, came because these newly enfranchised voters voted in incredible numbers. People, people were carried from hospital beds to right. go vote. Um, so it, th there was no apathy. Um, once that you know that 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 ability to vote happened, and it was a huge threat to the old kind of the old guard. Um, right. And the other big threat was this. You know, David also gets into this is the fusion party, which were people who were tired of the old guard, um, white and black, and they decided, well, if we vote together, we outnumber them. Why should they run everything? That's just a, a you know actually fairly small elite. And what that elite finally figured out is um, if we can deal the race card very specifically, um, the, the fear of miscegenation, the fear of black men raping white women, um, we can bring some of those people who are voting fusion, those white people who are voting fusion back to our side. Yeah. And that yeah. campaign just took off. Right. And, and you're right. That was the target of the white supremacy campaign with the, with, the, with the former populists, the white farmers who had become disillusioned with the Democratic Party and had made this, this sort of uneasy political pact with the Republicans, both black and white. And you're absolutely right. They had to be peeled back. And as you point out, the way they did it was, was racial and sexual fears and insecurity. Um, mm -hmm. The, there was a propaganda campaign that said there was a, uh, an epidemic of black men raping white women, and we've got to stop this. And secondly, that black men were not smart enough, intelligent enough, educated enough um, to have the right to vote. They didn't deserve the right to vote because they weren't capable of voting, and they certainly weren't capable of holding public office because uh, they, they were corrupt. Uh, and, and criminals and thugs. And as you know from the book, uh, Josephus Daniels, trying to reach those poor whites, those uneducated whites, it was almost 25% of the white population was illiterate, hired a political cartoonist who yeah. drew just some savage uh, political cartoons depicting black men as apes and brutes. And it was extremely effective in playing on, on, on white fear. So, you know, as you say, that was, was really successful. They peeled back all those, all, all those white voters, mm -hmm. uh, which they almost didn't need to do because of the, of the, the fraud and the ballot stuffing and the intimidation and all that, but uh, it certainly was effective. One of the things that I get in, into in a moment that is on the novel is there are several descriptions of political cartoons. A few I made up, most of them are, are literal. Yeah. And um, in both cases, the artists are just realizing I need more black ink. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, uh, in the case of the, the the North Carolina ones, it was you know their drawings of black people got blacker, literally mm -hmm. blacker. Um, in the case of the Philippines, artists who had, while we were helping the brave Filipino peasants fight against the dastardly Spanish. Um, they drew Filipinos because none of them had ever been to the Philippines. They kind of looked like Mexicans, the way they were. <laughs> um, 
they're off white, but really not that dark. Um, the minute we started fighting the Filipinos, uh, they became coal black savages, literally with grass skirts and bones in their noses. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, still having never been to the Philippines. Right. Um, so that, that kind of propaganda, I mean, one of, the, one of the most disturbing things about it was that um, how well it worked. Mm -hmm. That people who were in other ways very progressive, um, I forget the name of the woman who was, she was a feminist in her time. Oh, Belton, who, yeah. Who, you know, who made this incredible speech urging white men to lynch. Right, Rebecca Felton, yeah. Yeah, a day if possible. She was a very progressive person in, in many other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first novels, I think maybe the first novel written about the racial coup um, was written by Thomas Dixon. Thomas Dixon was uh, from North Carolina. He was a reverend, he was a preacher, he eventually uh, was very popular in New York City, progressive like a, a Teddy Roosevelt progressive on everything but race. <laughs> and uh, he later, you know, his second novel, The Klansman, got made into Birth of a Nation, uh, which is, you know, very well known now. His first novel was The Leopard Spots. And the copy that I got of The Leopard Spots um, has a front piece and, a, and, a, and a, a photograph at the back. And the front of it is, a photograph of his grandfather as a very old man in his Confederate uniform, very distinguished looking gray haired old gentleman. And then the, the photograph in the rear is a man who was a former slave. Um, you can't see what he's wearing because it's just kind of cropped that way. And he's got a craggy face. And Thomas Dixon says, before you even start to read this book, look at these two creatures and tell me that one should have the same rights as the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, he just could not deal with race at all, except in this extremely, extremely, extremely racist way. Um, you know, John, you use a lot of uh, historical figures, you know, mm -hmm. um, from the coup in your book. Um, we're just wondering, where did you do all your research before David's book existed? Did you come down to North Carolina? Or? Yeah, I, I, I came to Wilmington. I, the, the librarians there were very helpful. Um, there, there were a few accounts of the riot that you could kind of piece together. Um, there were some very biased ones in the newspapers that you could read. Uh, but there, there were also some just general books about Wilmington society, which got in, you know, to, oh, I know that name, you know, uh, the Sprunts and the you know, uh, the various, you know, Waddell and these various people who were important people, the McRae's who were important people in town. I went and, you know, looked at their mansions, which are still up. Um, not as beautiful as before, because a lot of the trees have been blown down since I've, I've been there. But um, really, and I, you know, I basically walked the neighborhoods and saw what was what left of those places. Uh, and, then, and then read about their further adventures. Uh, it, it seems like Josephus, Josephus Daniels eventually got to be like an undersecretary or secretary of the Navy. Um, he's why we have a cup of Joe. Right. Because he, he said, we shouldn't be giving grog to our sailors anymore. We don't want any alcohol on board. And so the sailors said, well, I guess we have to settle for a cup of Joe, Josephus. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, you're, you had to piece it together though, because there was so little written about the riot itself. Um, the, the Wilmington black middle class was truly established. So there was quite a bit written about them by people themselves. There were letters, there were you know, people who had gone to, to you know, university, stuff like that. And I was able to, to pick up a trail of people kind of uh, ironically, people from the Brooklyn neighborhood in Wilmington ended up in Brooklyn, New York. Right. Um, to the point where the Sprunt family, several years after the coup, sent recruiters up there and said, all is forgiven, please come back and work for us because white people won't, won't work for those wages. Right. Right. They're not as yeah. industrious as you are. <laughs> and That's true. too many took up their offer. Yeah. David, you've talked about you know some of the predecessors that you relied on uh, researching your book too, right? That there yeah, were, yeah. yeah. Um, there were, 
Yeah, quite a few, as you can imagine, white accounts, letters and diaries where they celebrated it and uh, bragged about it. You know, Waddell uh, wrote his memoirs. He wrote a story, a whitewashed story for Collier's Magazine two weeks after in which he completely fabricated everything that happened. Um, my best source was uh, Wilson Library at the University of North Carolina and the North Carolina Collection and the uh, 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 the Southern Historical Collection has a lot of original letters and diaries, and then uh, the state archives have official correspondence, and there was quite a bit of it from the governor back and forth with the, the militias. Um, and it was more difficult, and I'm sure John had this problem, was getting uh, uh, African-American accounts, but fortunately there were several ministers who mm -hmm. left uh, uh, their, their memoirs and who, who wrote accounts. And what was really interesting is uh, there was the black newspaper there, the record, which of course was burned, uh, burned down and all the records vanished. But when all these black families fled, mostly to the north, they were immediately interviewed by black newspapers who could not send obviously their correspondence to Wilmington because they'd be killed, but they got really fresh contemporaneous stories uh, in the black press, uh, people telling um, their stories. So that, that was quite helpful. And th those were, and then of course, newspapers were remarkable. Um, the white supremacist newspapers, in addition to the national press, because this, um, the, the white supremacists notified the entire world of what they were going to do well in advance, all the Northern newspapers sent their correspondence down that summer and fall. Uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, Chicago Trib, Philadelphia Inquirer, all these papers, and of course their white correspondents, and they completely adopted the white narrative. They just swallowed it. And I could not find, and I read a lot of newspapers, one instance in which they interviewed a black person. It's yeah. just incredible reporting. Um, and they were met at the train station by the white supremacists, and they gave them cigars and whiskeys and, and arranged their lodging and arranged to have them go out with, with the red shirts and with, with the, the, the military uh, sentries. They'd set up basically a military formation in the city prior to the coup. And they just filled them with the white narrative, which was that uh, it was the, the black man, not the white men who were stockpiling arms, that the, the blacks were planning to riot, to rise up, rape white women and kill white men and take over the city. Uh, the opposite was true. It was the, the whites who were stockpiling guns and, and planning a coup. But this was the story that the country got. And that's the story that remained for, for decades later, in large part due um, to the Northern press, in addition to the Southern press, which was almost completely white supremacist newspapers led by the News and Observer. So now the, let's just say there, there was a newspaper in North Carolina at the time called the Caucasian. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and that was the uh, popul uh, the populist party, I believe Butler uh, mm -hmm. wrote that. Uh, and he was that reasonably progressive, I mean, yeah. Yeah. To, to the rest of them. But I, yeah, that struck me. The name of that newspaper was pretty amazing. Yeah. I got quite a bit from those. Um, there were some some really um, good uh, uh, big city uh, black newspapers at that time. The Pittsburgh Courier. Yes. I think it was the Chicago Defender. There were a couple others. And I was also, um, because they were following kind of proudly at first, um, the exploits of African-American soldiers in the Spanish-American War and the Philippine-American War. I, I was using those newspapers for first person accounts of guys writing back, you know, right. you know, this happened at this battle. And, you know, there was this controversy where Teddy Roosevelt kind of discounted the efforts of the black soldiers in taking San Juan Hill and, and, and some of the other places um, in, in, uh, in Cuba. Um, so they were wonderful sources. And, you know, quite honestly, some very good amateur correspondence of just people describing, you know, um, very well written accounts of this is what happened to us in this particular battle, or this is how we got there, and this is how we're treated. Right. And what was interesting for me with both the, the Northern newspapers and the Southern newspapers is, is that the facts were correct. Like this happened at this time, and, and we killed this guy, and, and the descriptions were, it was just the uh, the way it was portrayed and the way, the way it was framed was, was was completely false, but it wasn't that hard to peel back the actual facts from um, the manipulation. And then 
my sounding board was then going to these uh, African American accounts, um, which really gave the point of view of what it was like to be black there, which was completely terrorizing and frightening, which obviously you didn't get at all from these triumphant uh, accounts in the white press. Yeah, and neither neither um, Cleveland nor McKinley uh, wanted to lose votes in the South. Nope. So even, you know, they were getting some reports that this is not good, lives are being lost, you, you might want to consider sending some federal troops in here and they didn't want to touch it. Nope. Um, John Henry, uh, George Henry White, who was a congressman from North Carolina, who was the only African-American in Congress, either in the Senate or the House in 1898, was from North Carolina from uh, the so-called Black Second, which adjoined um, Wilmington. He went to McKinley in the White House and warned him prior to the, to the riot and the coup. And after begging for interference, send federal troops, please, you've got to protect the right of African-Americans to vote. And separately, a delegation of black ministers went both before and after and talked to McKinley. And I could find no public statement at all from McKinley on it. I could find accounts where it was discussed at cabinet meetings. That you know, they would come out and say, we discussed it, but no details. He made no statement. And as you point out, he was running for re-election and he needed white votes. And I think he correctly realized that this uh, voter intimidation campaign was so successful, he wasn't going to be able to count on the black vote yeah. after that because they weren't going to be voting, but white yeah. people were. And I think he made a political calculation just to keep quiet, even though he was an abolitionist and a former union soldier. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and it, you know, it took uh, Dwight Eisenhower a good week um, to send federal troops in to Little Rock in, mm -hmm. I think it was 1954. Right. Um, and it was getting embarrassing. Yeah. You know? And that was, I think, the first time, you know, since the Civil War that, you know, federal troops had been sent to the I South. Think, I think you're right. Like yeah. That. It's a pretty and amazing. It, and it was because TV cameras were showing white adults spitting on these little kids. Right. Exactly. Brutality with the dogs and, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, gentlemen, that uh, our audience is ticking off similarities to January 6, 2021, <laughs> as you guys talk. And um, boy, just David, like reading your book, I'm just stunned at how often yeah. those parallels are obvious, including just the stupidity of the lies that we, yeah. we buy into. I don't want to put words in either of your mouths, but do you want to talk about the parallels between 1898 and... Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there are so many. First of all, is the disinformation in both campaigns, the big lie. Uh, the big lie in, in 1898 with that the, a black riot was being planned, that blacks couldn't were, weren't capable of voting, and that there was this uh, rape epidemic. The big lie in, in, uh, on January 6th was, of course, that the election was stolen. But um, the stolen election, by the way, uh, in 1898, um, one of the driving forces was that the claim that the election that put the municipal government in power in 1897 had been stolen. Uh, with fraudulent black voting. And of course, we've got the same thing uh, mm -hmm. under Trump. Um, there was also um, this sense of your very birthright and your nation being stolen from you. And in, in 1898, uh, these white voters were told that these black men were stealing your birthright, your right to run your own affairs, you know, and Trump a little much more subtly, mm -hmm. but was telling his followers, your country, your white Christian country, without saying it in so many words, is being stolen from you by, you remember in 2016, even when he won, he said 6 million uh, immigrants voted illegally. And of course, in, in, in January 6th, he specifically focused on four cities, uh, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Detroit, and the African-American precinct saying this was where the fraud was. So he was creating this narrative that these people of other races and other colors are threatening your white nationalism. And I think that was a big driving force. Um, finally, there was um, the equating of vigilantism with patriotism. The, the whites in 1898 firmly believed that they had to use violence and it was justified because they had been so wronged by what they called, quote, Negro rule and Negro domination. 
And in, in, on January 6th, Trump made it very clear, uh, you know, uh, we've got to do something. If What was the quote? It was, uh, if you don't take your country back or if you don't, uh, if you don't fight, you're, you're going to lose your country. And that was clearly a message that uh, vigilantism uh, was justified in this case because of the threat and because the election was stolen from you. Yeah, I think another thing, you know, that that you you, you always have to factor in is that the Civil War really did not end, um, and maybe it still hasn't. Um, right. Up until I think it was in the 1930s. Um, there was not just Memorial Day, there was in the South, there was, you know, the Memorial Day and there was the Day of the Confederate Dead. And they were a week apart. Um, and in a place like Wilmington, um, on the federal holiday, black people would go to the cemetery where um, the white people who had fought for the Union and died there were buried. And they would read quotes from Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and have their celebration. And then I forget if it was a week earlier or a week later, the white people would go to the cemetery where the Confederate dead were and they would celebrate that. Um, the showing of, you know, the, the flying of the Confederate flag was illegal until the mid 1870s. Um, so these are people who still in, you know, these are many of them, the older guys are Civil War veterans. They feel like they're an occupied country. Mm -hmm. And uh, the troops have gone, but those evil laws and those rules that were put in by the occupier are still there. And here's our chance. We're going to lose it all if we don't take this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, they, in, in Wilmington, they called it King Numbers. Yep. You no, know, and, and they're, they're, they've got the numbers. And, you know, it, it's, been a, a Republican talking point for a long time is the more people vote, the worse our chances are. <laughs> well, yeah, Donald Trump was, said that. Yeah. What was happening in, in Wilmington, you know, was if everybody votes, we don't have a chance. Yeah, they were so outnumbered. We have to eliminate voters. And if it takes something like a Gatling gun mm -hmm. that we demonstrate to the so-called responsible people in the, in the Black community, uh, we'll do that, and then it's going to be circulating on election day, right. and we're going to have other people out in red shirts, you know, at every polling place, and we're going to make sure that the wrong people don't get in. Right. Yeah. John, I've heard you in other interviews talk about, you know, the amazing trick of mind that convinces you you're doing good in these mm -hmm. slaughters. You know, I, I think um, as even in Moment in the Sun, you often reference people thinking they're they're doing. God's good work in slaughtering fellow humans. Um, I don't know, does that, um, do you still yeah, see well, that playing out? I, I think it's a, it's a long process. Um, so, so much of the lore, the folklore, the people speaking from the, the pulpit, um, interpreting the Bible um, about the inferiority of the black race I think comes out of people being Christians, wanting to feel good about themselves, and yet do these terrible things. Yeah. And and so you know, I think we we there we we only know what we want to know. Right. You know, I th I think the official name is cognitive dissonance, but it's something that I've dealt with a lot, which is willful ignorance. Mm -hmm. If knowing this thing to be true is going to upset your whole world, I don't want to know it. I don't want to right. see it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to think about it. And so I have to make up another narrative. Right. And, and you um, believe in the and, big lie. Yeah. And, and what that does, it, is, it allows you to feel really good about what you're doing when you're burning down somebody's house. Right. Exactly. Um, because you're doing it because, you know, God told you to. It, yeah. You know, it's... Your, your, your pastor will back you up. Uh, your, your tribe, your community will back you up. Um, you know, Mrs. Felton will get up there and say, you know, if you're a red-blooded white man, this is your duty. This is your duty in front of God and white culture and, you know, whatever is decent and holy. And the people on January 6th called themselves patriots. Oh, absolutely. This is patriotism. This is what a patriot does. You fight and you get your country back. It was very clear. Yeah. 
And, you know, so, you know, and I'm sure there were people in Nazi uniforms who felt the same way. Yeah, exactly. they, and they were brave, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to, you know, question their cause, but you can't question their, their bravery because they right. were taking a risk. They were committed, yeah. 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 Um, all right, John, I have to ask you, uh, so uh, Moment in the Sun, you know, you make a film, Amigo, was that, was, did you write that screenplay first or the novel first? No, I actually wrote a screenplay um, that incorporated both the Wilmington riot and the, the yeah, film the American <laughs> War. Um, but once we, once we budgeted it and decided, there's no way in hell anybody's ever gonna give us enough money to do this well. Um, so it, it actually is one of the, the you know, instances where I wrote a screenplay first. And then at, when I wrote the book, it's a, over a thousand page book, things started to expand as I, I learned more and characters deepened and, and stuff like that. So, but, but there was this, you know, this basic, you know, connection that imperialism, our imperialism, uh, there's a, you know, a, a famous speech at the, of the time called the March of the Flag. And if you read the March of the Flag, it's very patriotic, but it's also extremely racist. Um, you know, Rudyard Kipling's poem, Pick Up the White Man's Burden, the subtitle of it is America and the Philippines. Right. And he's saying, basically, this is not an opportunity. This is your Christian duty. This is your white Christian duty. This is what we do for the world. We go to these silent, sullen people, and they may not like it at first, but we bring them democracy and soap and popcorn or whatever else we bring, you know, and so a couple million may have to get killed, but, you know, this is what we have to do. Um, so if that was the whole country's idea about the rest of the world, including, you know, especially the non-white, non, you know, so-called developed world, uh, what you can imagine is, there weren't that many people in the North who looked at Wilmington and said, this is awful. <laughs> there weren't that many white people there. You know, they must have just said, well, of course they're doing this. They'll be outnumbered otherwise. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I quote from a lot of editorials in the Northern newspapers who said, well, this might have been a little too violent, but um, the cause was just and something had to be done uh because these these uh, african american men they're just not ready for mm -hmm. democracy they're not ready to vote and and it's and it's time that good white christian men were in charge and that's the way it's supposed to be and these are northern newspapers and very very few condemned uh of the, the coup very very few most of them uh condemned the violence but not the outcome yeah one thing that david's very aware of having written about uh south africa um, is just like apartheid, um, Jim Crow didn't start right away. It, it came in gradually after this incident and more and more regulations were put in there. I, I thought it was always an interesting thing that uh, originally the law was that um, black people had to sit at the front of the bus because the bus was being hauled by animals and that was the stinky end of the bus. <laughs> And then when they got motors and the motor and the bus is in the back, yeah. that's the hot and stinky end of the bus right. and move to the back of the bus. But, yeah. um, you know, it, really, there's a story to be told if you just look at the laws. Yeah. Uh, in any of the southern states, if you look at the black laws, um, which get more and more stringent, one of the things with a law is you don't see a law against something unless people were doing it. And usually the first of the black laws that were enacted are ones saying, well, you can have all the mixed race children you want, but you can't give them any of your land. Right. You can't give them your name, you know, because people were doing that. Um, and then they said, well, and then those laws got, you know, eventually there were laws against, um, for instance, in Virginia, you could free your slaves but if they didn't leave the state within a year, they could put back into slavery and just sold to somebody else. They didn't want that many free blacks around. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a long, long story. And what really got me is just how erased it had been. 
just how buried it had been. Right. And that's a very, very conscious thing. Um, at some point, fairly quickly, um, I'd say maybe 20, 25 years after, after those men had been elected to higher office, they decided not to celebrate it mm -hmm. anymore. In fact, let's just quiet. They buried it, yeah. They yeah. buried it. Hey, David, that, that brings up a really interesting point. I've always, you know, so there's this fact that you can't get elected in North Carolina unless you're connected to Wilmington 1898. And then sometime in history, it gets buried again. It becomes shameful. Like, how does that transform from you need it to get elected to it becomes this shame that can't be talked about? Mm -hmm. Or am I overemphasizing shame, maybe? Yeah, I, I, there was no shame. These people yeah. were shameless. They weren't yeah. ashamed. They just, it was inconvenient mm -hmm. uh, to keep celebrating this. So they just, they just let it die. And I quote in the book from uh, state textbooks taught to high school students, where if it's mentioned at all, it's mentioned as this glorious event uh, and unfortunate uh, that we, the whites, were put in this position of having to restore good, clean government uh, because we made the mistake of allowing uh, unqualified black men uh, to be in office. And, and that was the narrative that carried through and they completely discounted and ignored the violence. You won't see any mention of murders and violence and dead black men. It was just a good government uh, effort. Uh, and I would encourage people uh, to read some of those textbooks. I mean, there are people alive today who were raised on those textbooks. Some of them were from 19, as recently as the 1940s. And I've checked the textbooks today. They barely, barely mention uh, the, the coup. And if they do, and it's just a quick summary with very little about violence and about the long-term impact. And in fact, in giving uh, book talks, I've had many teachers in North Carolina come up and tell me that this is not part of our curriculum, but I've started teaching it anyway. And mm -hmm. there is a move with the, uh, I think it's the State Teachers Association or some group of uh, educators to, for a law or a requirement that it be included um, in the high school textbooks, which is not now. I think it's very telling that um, they, they didn't necessarily want all those black people to leave. No, wanted them to, to, you know, behave themselves and do work and, and not demand any more pay and not be organized mm -hmm. and not vote. But along with the black people who just fled uh, on their own, um, they got rid of their white opposition. Absolutely. They got rid of the fusionists who weren't willing, you know, in chains, uh, put them on a train and basically said, do not get off the train for your own safety until you get to Philadelphia. Because mm -hmm. there are people that we have wired and are waiting to lynch you. If you exactly. get off in Baltimore or Washington, D.C., you're probably okay in Philadelphia. Yeah. No, uh, there. It, it wasn't just anti black, it was nope. truly anti democratic. Oh, it was white traitors. Yeah. White traitors was the term, and, and these people were as angry at the, at the white Republicans as they were at the black. The black men, they said, were duped. Yeah. by these sinister carpetbaggers and scalawags, these, these white Republicans. And there was a formal banishment campaign and half that list was the white leadership, which they forcibly removed. And as you say, they marched them to the train station and said, get on that train, keep going. And if you ever come back here, we will shoot you on sight. And not one of those banished people, black or white, ever returned to Wilmington. I think that's truly remarkable. And that was their home. I mean, they, they went back generations and none of them, they were terrified. They lost their lose. houses, they lost everything, yeah, property, just, businesses. I mean, just that day where, well, the, the black men were, were sent to jail and held in jail that night. The white men uh, were picked up the next morning and marched by the militia to the train and, and put on the train, to the train station and put on the train. And they never came back. On January 6th, that becomes hang Mike Pence, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same white trader, you know, people yeah. are traitors to the cause. Uh, people we once uh, admired and were our friends. Some of these were friends and family members in Wilmington and they still did it. And, uh, but once you turn on us, uh, you're a traitor and uh, you've got to be banished. Hey, you guys, how about a quick uh, talk about the voter suppression movement in Georgia and elsewhere that just is so similar. Um, I, I think they made it illegal in Georgia to carry 
people out of the hospital to go vote. Right, or to uh, give them water or food. Or give them water. While they're waiting in line, which is yeah. pretty pretty remarkable. Yeah, I mean, voter suppression is 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 not new. Um, there are subtle and less subtle ways to do it. Um, I don't think what the Republican Party is doing right now. Uh, I I they were pretty successful under Trump of doing just getting rid of subtlety altogether, you know, <laughs> and with a kind of big lie technique. Um, so, and, and it is, they're fighting for their lives. Um, they know that the demographics, you know, uh, you know, unless they can keep people from voting, they can't win. Um, they do not, they are not the most popular party. Um, and instead of saying, what should we change in our policies, you know, how do we win those, you know, voters back? It's how do we keep those voters from voting? Right. Well, in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina is a leader in the votes, uh, the voter suppression category. And is as early as 19, um, as 2011, when the Republicans, for the first time since 1898, got control of the, the state legislature, they passed a voter ID bill. But before they did, they bombarded the state election board with very specific questions of how many black people used early voting, what days, how many black people voted on Sunday on souls to the polls, mm -hmm. how many black people had a driver's license or some other sport form of state identification, and they tailored the voter ID law mm -hmm. to cut the, you know, the Sunday voting, to cut early voting, to, to require a, a, a driver's license, and it was thrown out by the federal courts, and one quote from one of the federal judges was that the voter ID bill targeted African Americans with surgical precision, that it was very blatant, designed to keep African Americans from voting. And the other thing that white conservatives in North Carolina have done that the white supremacists did in 1898 is gerrymandering. 1898, there were two wards, they crammed the black majority into two wards to dilute their voting power, the white conservatives in North Carolina, and as a matter of fact, the Republican delegation to the state house is 100% white, which is truly stunning. Into given the this year. in the 21st century, it's 100% white, almost entirely male. They gerrymandered uh, two congressional districts to pack all the African American voters in, and then leave all the other districts safe for white Republicans, and 28. Uh, legislative districts, and in two separate cases, the federal courts both ruled and the Supreme Court upheld that these were illegal, racial, not political gerrymanders, that the quote from the judge was race was the paramount concern, and they threw those out as well. But here we are 120 some years later, and white conservatives are still scheming, not with violence or intimidation or open racism, but still scheming to keep African Americans from voting because if you let them vote, as you point out, we'll never win again. And Donald Trump said, if everybody is allowed to vote, you'll never had, have another Republican elected to office. That was a direct quote. So at least I give him credit for uh, candor. And it's, it's literally a fear of fusion. Yes. It's, you know, it's not called the fusion party no. anymore, but it's literally a fear of if the you know, white people who don't like us and the Hispanic people and the black people and the other immigrants all vote together, we're, we're toast, we're, right. we can't win. Yeah. And it's changing every year, it's getting worse and worse it's, for, for, for white, American, white American males, it's, yeah. it's not looking good. Which, which let's just say, um, you, to get white American males to feel like they are a class, mm -hmm. you really have to hit some heavy cultural things. Oh yeah, it's guns. Not, it's not about you know economic policy or anything like that. You have to really make them feel like they're they're you know being castrated, right? Um, exactly. And that so often that kind of language comes up in in the South um, during those twenty five years or so that the Union Army was still you know mm. they, they've made women of us down here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been emasculated exactly, yeah. and I think that's where the guns this this worshiping of guns really comes in. I think that plays into that. And that's how we defend ourselves. They've God given right to guns and mm. and also uh, sort of demonizing and dehumanizing other people such as African Americans, Muslims, immigrants, gay people, the the uh, uh, the black uh, 
Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Trump has been very, very clear about portraying them as thugs and anarchists and people who are gonna come to your neighborhood. Remember the ad during the, uh, to the 2020 campaign that showed the white woman in the suburbs, here's a noise at night at home, she's alone, she calls 911. They said, sorry, we can't come now, they've defunded the police, we can't help you. Mm -hmm. I mean. That, you couldn't be more blatant and here these black people are coming to burn down your neighborhood and uh -huh. can't help you. I think, uh, uh, you know, one interesting thing is, uh, and this, this speaks to um, why, why the, this history stopped being celebrated, is North Carolina, the old North State, as they used to call themselves, mm -hmm. have always liked to think of themselves more like, well, we're like Virginia. We're kind of moderate on this whole thing. We're not the rednecks, you know, of South <laughs> Carolina and Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and so I think just a, a matter of political style, um, you 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 tried not to run as a you know segregationist, and that's my main you know mm -hmm. reason to vote for me in North Carolina. It just yeah. didn't work that well. Yeah, you're right. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the reasons that well, let's just not talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jesse Helms changed all that. He was the first one to go openly racist yeah. and segregationist, and uh, and it worked that's, for him. You know, he was in for a long time. He was in for a long time, and he changed the entire image of North Carolina from, as you say, yeah. this progressive and moderate state to right along with Mississippi and Alabama and mm -hmm. hard charging segregationist white uh, states' rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it hasn't really changed since then. Mm -hmm. Even though we're going a bit purple, but uh, a long way to go. Long way to go. Hey guys, we're we're running out of time. David, I wanted to ask you: um, have, Has anyone offered a film interest in Wilmington's Lie? Yeah, there have been a couple of production companies who are. Uh, one has made an offer, and the other one is 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 going to make an offer. They're very interested in in uh, you know buying the option. So, can can you make them have project. John direct it or no? <laughs> yeah, God, I'd be happy. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. One, you know, it's full of wonderful characters. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a kind of sorry mess of history, and, right. and you know, there's not much to feel good about at the end of it. No, uh, and a lot of villains. One of the reasons, you know, that that I I felt like I could deal with it just in terms of my mood writing a book is you you get the further adventures of the African American people who left. Yes, and they did go other places and survive and. Some of them did well, and some of them did less well. Some of them, you know, went went down a couple notches in class, yeah. you know, for a generation or two. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a it's a tough story. It's uh, very yeah, it's a very depressing story, and with a lot of villains and not many heroes. Uh, Alex Manley might be your best best shot, you know, at a hero, and he did go on to a very productive life in Philadelphia, but he mm -hmm. never went back to Wilmington. I, I uncovered a thing where he he was part owner of a gym. Mm -hmm. Or Jack Johnson um, <laughs> trained for a while. There, that is true. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> oh, uh, really fascinating conversation. Thank you both so much. Um, uh, can John, are you working on a film right now? Oh, I've got like, always got like three or four just add money kind of projects. I'm uh, sure you do. <laughs> some of them historical and some of them more contemporary. Uh, and I have a book coming out. Um, not quite as big as a moment in the sun. It probably won't come out until the very beginning of 2023 called Jamie McGill of Ray, which is set, um, it, it uh, starts at the Battle of Culloden and ends at the Battle of Quebec. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can, uh, let me just say the research in this book is just amazing. You know, like, especially like when you're in Leadville talking about the coal mine, I'm just stunned that you're yeah, I've gotten actually to go to almost all the places that I wrote yeah. about, you know, yeah. for various reasons. And um, I find that the actual history, um, I don't I don't veer from it very much. So, you know, when the, the 24th Infantry, the African-American Infantry do something in my novel, it's because I've got the the military handout of this is what they did on that day. And it's a better story usually than anything you could make up. <laughs> That's right. right, right. And David, for your, you're like, your narrative is so novelistic in, in Wilmington's Lie. Are, are there novels you love that, that influence your writing or? Um, my influence, you know, has been mostly nonfiction. Uh, the first 
book that really shocked me and moved me and made me want to be a, a journalist was Hiroshima by John Hersey, mm-hmm. which is is a, a, a very powerful narrative focusing on a, on a small group of characters to tell the larger story of, of Hiroshima. So that that has been my inspiration. Uh, and even uh, people like Tolstoy, uh, who, who actually was a journalist talking about uh, the wars in the Caucasus, that kind of thing really and inspired me. So uh, that's that's my uh, that's my day job is uh, international correspondent. So right. that's why I'm interested in those sort of subjects. Yeah. All right. And I guess I just want to close by saying I interviewed two writers from uh, Appalachia, Leah Hampton and Robert Geith last week. And we talked a lot about um, outsiders trying to write about Appalachia. Mm-hmm. And so I mentioned Maitland and they said, well, John Sales is different. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Leah, <laughs> Leah in particular said, the movie made me realize I could write about my life, you know, that it was important yeah. enough to think about and write about. And so they were very appreciative for yeah. that film. Well, one of my big honors is I'm an honorary member of the UMW local in May. <laughs> nice, that's a great honor. <laughs> All right, this was an honor for me, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I really, I'm just thrilled with uh, both of your works. Um, oh, one last question, David, what are you working on next? Uh, my day job, um, Afghanistan, covering Afghanistan, and as you know, there's a May 1st deadline to get U.S. troops yeah. out, so it's a very pivotal time there, so that's, that's my focus at the moment. All right, thank you both so much. This will be the uh, final event of Greensboro Bound. Uh, look for it on May 16th at 6 p.m. Thank you once again to John Sales and David Zucchino. Uh, thrilled to have you both. Have a great day. Thanks, Brian. It was great. Bye, everyone. Take Bye. care. Thank you again for joining us for 21 Conversations. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like and share with your friends and fellow readers. One final reminder that Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing together readers and writers throughout the year at zero cost to our community. Please help Greensboro Bound maintain that commitment with a sustaining or one-time gift now. The number to text to give and our website are on your screen. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person next year at Greensboro Bound.